So, uh, thanks a lot, Mark. Um, uh, what I'm going to be talking back to is really, let's say, just some theoretical ideas we've been playing with. So, uh, one of the things that we do with KIC is that we really, let's say, try and uh, find niches where policy making hasn't been developed enough or needs more work, try and highlight these, try and accelerate the work on them. And one of the things that we've been spending an inordinate amount of time on lately is really this line in the council recommendation on micro-credentials, which says that we're supposed to support the quality and transparency of micro-credentials by applying, adapting, and developing quality assurance mechanisms. I think we can all agree on that. Um, now there's just a tiny, tiny little question of how on earth do we go about actually doing that? Um, so what I'm sharing is just, let's say, some of the ideas and some of the thoughts we've had around this. It's really uh, ideas for discussion. And also, let's say, some projects that we are thinking of uh, launching in the coming days. Now, first of all, just one idea I'd like to uh, put in your heads is that if you think about a risk-based approach to quality assurance, then the lower or the smaller the credential, quite likely the smaller the level of risk involved as well. And I'll come to this more in the next slides. But it's one thing if I'm going to spend five years of my life studying something. It's another thing if I'm going to spend five hours of my life studying something. And how do we actually calibrate these levels in a way that makes sense and still maintains quality assurance? I just randomly looked up quality assurance of micro-credentials in higher education this morning and just pasted the first thing I found on a slide. Um, and this, so don't blame Aneka. Uh, it was just the first Google hit. Um, and this is what they say about quality assurance in higher education. Um, royal degree, royal degree, royal degree, internal quality assurance, external quality assurance, process, process, procedure, quality assurance. Uh, it's just like, boom. Um, okay, uh, I'm 100% sure this is a great system <laughs> and is really, really thought through. But the text is on the slides just to say this is really, really a lot. And some of the questions I just wanted to ask is if we look into the assumptions behind traditional quality assurance in higher education, there are, some, there are some assumptions we never talk about because it's just the way things have always been done. But when you're looking at quality assurance of micro-credentials, we really need to ask, are these assumptions still true? Assumption number one, programs cannot be allowed to fail. A student is going to spend years of their life doing this. You can't just come in for two years into a program, say, you know what, this isn't working. I'll shut it down. Sorry, try again. We can't do this. So protect, so design and planning and making sure that programs are built so that they cannot fail is really a major, major goal of every quality system we have for higher education. The question, and by the way, I don't have answers for any of the questions I asked today. Um, the question is, in a micro-credential, where we're talking hours, not years, uh, can a micro-credential be allowed to fail if we so often? Question. Second part of this is our IQA systems, our internal quality assurance systems, are built around high degrees of collegiality. It's the way things are done at universities. Decisions are taken by big groups of people. And one of the reasons that's done is not because good, efficient decisions are taken in committees. Um, generally, it's because universities in particular are interdisciplinary institutions. So if you want to build a program that brings together different disciplines, you have to bring all those different disciplines together to talk about it. If we're talking about these very small units of learning, where we're talking about we're teaching a specific competence, the interdisciplinarity for some micro-credentials goes away. If you don't have the interdisciplinarity of the micro-credential, do you need the same level of collegiality in developing the micro-credential? Again, I have no idea. Um, and thirdly, the other big one is that all of this stuff is so important that only licensing 
can protect learners. This is a high value uh, service and we need the protection of the government to make sure that learners are not shortchanged, which means if you're going to accredit, accrediting equals licensing equals protection of learners. And it's another of the assumptions built into our systems. So the only question I'm going to ask at the moment is for many micro-credentials, are higher education quality models sometimes a bit of an overkill? Are they too heavy? On the other hand, I said, let me see what alternative providers do. Again, same, same very, very deep methodology. I googled it and put the first hit I found onto a slide. This is from Udemy, and this is just a screenshot from 10 minutes ago. And here you can see kind of the information they give you about quality assurance. So here, there's a completely different assumption built into this. Student ratings are the most important. There's a star rating next to each course. It's entirely market driven. Number of stars equals how good the course is. The end. Um, I don't know about you, um, uh, but uh, yeah, stars are good, but I mean, what on earth does those stars actually mean? Not to mention that everything seems to be between 4.7 and 4.9 anyway, but is just a star rating really enough to know what's in a micro-credential? The other assumption built into alternative provider QA is that quality control is a business decision. External quality assurance, licensing, these are not things that are required, and it's up to me as a platform provider to decide how important quality assurance is to me. And I can build a micro-credential portal where quality is very important to me, and I can build a micro-credential with no quality assurance at all. And then the market can decide how much quality assurance is needed. And again, that's one of the assumptions that goes into the quality models of alternative providers. So my question here, when I start looking at this, I do ask, are alternative provider models possibly too light for micro-credentials? Uh, you go to a supermarket and pick pretty much anything off the shelf, and, uh, and safety standards, food hygiene standards, all kinds of standards have gone into the creation of that. All sorts of quality models stand behind it. In the end, you can choose whatever you want off the shelf, and you don't have to read a 17-page uh, accreditation document. But there are quality standards that are behind it, which is not the case for all the micro-credentials you find online. So again, I have a feeling that there's some sort of golden mean between these two extremes. If anybody knows where it is, please let me know. Um, but these are some of the kind of thoughts that are going into our thinking. Now, one more thing. I wanted to, to do is say, okay, so if I want to know how good a micro-credential is, how do I actually go about doing it? So I did, I asked the question the way you answer every question in life. I asked Google. Um, but first I said, let me do something like really dumb. Uh, so I asked it, where do I find a good burger in Castel del Fels? And I know we've kind of gotten used to this now, but take a moment to appreciate just how much information is on the screen and how many services have been integrated to produce it. We have ratings that come from independent rating services. We have a mapping service that means it's been tied to geolocation. We have links to other rating sites. We have search results. There's about 20 different APIs and services that have been integrated together to tell me where the closest good burger in Costa del Fels is. It's quite incredible. Now let's ask the same question about where is the best micro-credential in business analytics? It's a dumb list of links. And if you notice, none of that dumb list of links actually tells me anything about the quality information involved. So this data just isn't available to me. And I would argue that the best micro-credential in business analytics is slightly more high stakes than the burger in Castel de Fels. So something isn't working here. Um, this quality information either does not exist or it is not available. And that is something that really in this day and age of digital everything is completely unacceptable. So our crazy idea that we're exploring is saying, can we publish and aggregate quality data on micro-credentials? 
And in thinking about this crazy idea, we just started looking around and saying, somebody must have done it already. Uh, the short answer is no. Uh, but uh, there are a few like portals we look at and we say, hey, these people are at least looking in the right direction. So one inspiration, if for example, you go to studyportals.eu, you'll find a list of universities and they've at least taken the trouble to look at the different university rankings and put them next to them for each one. I'm not gonna get into a debate of if you like rankings or not, that's not the point. Uh, the point though is that they at least said, don't go to the website of each ranking provider to find it out, they brought them together on one page. Another one, and I know some of these people are in the room, the database of European quality assurance results has put in quite a bit of effort on interoperability. So they didn't just publish a database of quality assurance results, they made this available as digital data you can access. And now it's being used by all sorts of different portals. So you can actually query this database and ask, is this program quality assured? They didn't just do that. They, all, they also like started publishing the accreditation documents themselves as digital credentials. So really, let's say, taking this very, very dense, very unfriendly information and making it available in a way that maybe somebody might actually be able to consume it and use it for something if they're not a quality assurance expert. One more, the open up ed quality label from uh, EADTU. In the end, it's a vision of quality promoted by an organization. They say, this is what we understand by micro-credential quality, and then say, these are the institutions that meet our vision of micro-credential quality. So again, you could think of this in technical terms as a trusted list. This is a list of institutions trusted by this organization for quality. And these are kind of just some ideas of people trying to share data on quality assurance. So we'd like to try and scale this and what we want to do is build what we call a quality data clearinghouse. And the idea, the principles that would go behind a quality data clearinghouse are actually six. First of all, competition is good. We want the micro-credentials to be available and we want the best micro-credentials to be the ones that students take. And the best way to do the best micro-credentials is let them duke it out and let the students decide. Secondly, we want to think of quality not just as student protection as a minimum, we want to think quality in terms of more of guidance. How does quality help you make the best decision for your personal goals? Remember, one definition of quality is fitness for purpose. So how is quality helping you with your personal fitness for purpose? Of course, that's very, very linked to the idea of student choice. We also start thinking we're like, no compound indicators, uh, not because they're not good, but they're too complicated and too compound. And what do they mean anyway? That's us enforcing our vision quality on quality on you. The second you make a compound indicator, you've made a judgment, and that isn't what we want to do. Very, very important, no walled gardens. We, want, we don't want quality data to be locked into a single institution or a single platform. We want that quality data to be able to travel between platforms and between organizations. And we want to democratize quality data, which means uh, we believe that anyone should be able to make a quality rating. And then it's up to you as an individual whose opinion to trust. But in the end, just like with the ADTU example, an, a small organization can make a very, very good quality list. A licensed accreditation agency can make a very, very good quality list. Uh, a student who has spent the last three years of their life trying every business analytics MOOC because they're a nerd could write a blog post with like the most authoritative list of micro-credentials because they've tested them all. There are lots of different sources of quality data and anyone that produces quality data should be able to make that available. How you use it and whether you consider this authoritative, that's a different discussion. But let's at least first have it available. So what we want to do is this. This is kind of the big brain map. This is what we call our kind of map of micro-credential trust. And these are the areas that we feel will go into deciding if a micro-credential is actually quality or not. At the top, you have the QA procedures applied. This is the more traditional view of quality assurance. 
things like accreditation, things like the quality assurance strategies of platforms. For example, Coursera has quite a rigid quality assurance procedure. It also has IQA procedures that you might find in an institution. And if you actually think about, are there indicators, are there databases for this? There are, there are lots of sources you can look to for it. Everything from DECAR to national databases to the lists maintained by platforms that quality assure the courses that go into them. If you're thinking about the expertise of teachers that actually teach it, there are their LinkedIn profiles, their scholar profiles, et cetera, et cetera. This is all relevant data. Secondly, you might say in what I, we call institutional reputation. And institutional reputation is kind of built on two ones. Number one, there are lots of ranking and labeling lists that classify institutions in different ways. Um, also, you have networks where you're a member of this network or this league or this organization. And all of those go into building up your institutional reputation. Again, if I want to query your university and find out which networks and leagues and European universities you're a member of, I have to kind of just read a lot of documents. I can't access this data. Employer demand is a quite an important one. And I mean, the States has done a lot of work on this in terms of just publishing the degrees and the employability of each degree from each university, institution by institution. I'm not sure we really have a parallel in Europe yet, but we do have tons of skills intelligence data that tell us which skills are actually in demand by employers and whether a micro-credential is teaching something that anybody has any demand for. There's the recognition history, which as far as we know, there isn't really a good data source on yet, but the idea is which institutions have actually recognized this micro-credential for academic purposes. It would be lovely if we could know this. And lastly, student feedback, the famous stars. Every one of these is useful on its own, but could you imagine if we managed to put this together for micro-credentials and then just said, this is everything we know about the quality of a micro-credential. Now you decide if it's good for you or not. That's what we're trying to get to. And how, uh, now you might think you're uh, replacing one super administrative procedure with a list of indicators as long as your arm. How does that help student choice? This is just something I see, uh, took of Coursera, and it's actually a really good example of how you can take all these concepts and build them into a very, very simple, very, very easy UX. You notice on Coursera, this is, they don't do this for every course, by the way, but this is one example. I have the student rating. I have the instructor rating, just with the top instructor label. I have information about the employer demand in the description. I have information about the student performance after the course in the description. And actually, a ton of data has been brought together for this. But the difference with this example is that all of this is just stuff that is claimed by the course uh, advertiser. I have no idea if any of this is true, and it's information they chose to share. But when we imagine this as a service, we imagine being able to do something that looks kind of like this, but by bringing together different data sources from different providers to be able to put the stuff together for micro-credentials. So that's what we would like to do. Now here's all the reasons we can't do it. Um, this is uh, actually a massive challenge because pretty much none of the infrastructure required to do this exists at the moment. Quality certifications are generally not awarded as digital labels. Most quality certifications are a list on a website or a PDF or something like this. So the data doesn't necessarily exist yet for most quality certifications. So already you have to digitize that data to begin with just to be able to begin accessing it. Secondly, even if they do digitize the data, there are very, very limited examples of people actually sharing that data in machine-readable format. We showed the Dekar example, which is really best in class when it comes to this, but they're kind of a lone wolf in the wilderness at the moment. We'd like to do that for all quality data. Thirdly, the number of directories that actually aggregate quality data at the moment are next to none. Directories tend to build their own rating system. They tend to consider their own proprietary information, and they don't necessarily share or integrate external quality services. There isn't really a culture of it yet. Then there are the more technical issues. If I'm looking at a micro-credential and I'm looking at the information of the micro-credential from three or four different databases, 
there's no actual way of being sure it's the same micro-credential or the same version. There isn't an identifier for courses that we would be able to use to match this data. So even if they did publish the data, synthesizing it and combining it would be extremely, extremely difficult. And let's face it, even basic course metadata is often not available. I mean, uh, I loved some of the presentations we had at this conference, but some part of me can't believe that in 2023, we're still talking about putting learning outcomes and competences on courses. I mean, haven't we figured out this is important yet? And how on earth are we gonna do skills matching if people won't say what skills their courses are supposed to teach? And lastly, student ratings and student evaluation results. While for alternative providers, it's become quite common to publish this information, in many higher education institutions, these are closely guarded state secrets, which if we said, ah, yeah, just put it all on the website and not just that, make it indexable by Google, there would be a little bit of pushback there. So these are kind of the challenges that we are working on. Um, there's no specific project and no specific website for us to pitch to you because we're actually putting together a whole family of five or six different projects that will work on different bits of the problems over the next few years. So for now, I'll say stay tuned till next year. We'll tell you how it's going. But we just wanted to share the ideas we've been thinking about in this area. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your attention.